Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Thanks for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jessica Kofi. By now, I'm sure you're well aware of the spread of COVID-19 and how it's had an unprecedented effect on our society and with cancellations being widespread, the most unexpected one was came for all of live sports. So now that we're all social distancing and quarantining ourselves and staying inside. We have a little bit of a sports-shaped hole that we need to fill. And what better way to do that than by looking back on our favorite sports moments? And more specifically in college football, there's no better time than now to go back and watch maybe a few of our favorite games or maybe see some historic games for the first time if we hadn't seen them before. So in this episode, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be recounting a handful of the best games in college football history that are worth that rewatch, or that if you missed the first time, you definitely need to see. So a lot of games can fit into that criteria, but first up, we have to start with a game that has gone down in history, even though it was only about a decade and a half ago. And that game is the 2006 Rose Bowl between Texas and USC. So this game really doesn't need any introduction or recap, but We have plenty of time to fill, so it'll definitely be fun to look back on this one. Both teams coming into this game were undefeated. USC came into the national championship game at the end of that season on a 34-game win streak. They had two Heisman winners in the backfield and so much confidence that they can fill that 100,000-seat Rose Bowl Stadium over and over again. Um, And on top of that, they had all the boost in the world from ESPN, who spent all of that December of 05 trying to figure out where the Trojans fell among the best teams in history at that point. They were being considered one of the greatest teams of all time, and they'd they'd come off of two straight national championship wins. So they definitely were in that category, but Texas Longhorn players at the time were definitely not amused. It really enraged them and they have recounted stories of just feeling disrespected because they themselves saw through saw through the Big Ten the Big Twelve that year, excuse me. Um and they thought that they also had some of the country's best players, including a a Nara Heisman runner up themselves. So they also went undefeated in that season, but they were already being considered and talked about as the underdogs. So it's very clear that they didn't appreciate that. And there was some added bad blood coming into the game because uh, Reggie Bush, running back for USC, won the Heisman over quarterback Vince Young and Matt Leiner, who was his own quarterback, Uh, but he definitely deserved it. He totaled 2,200 scrimmage yards, had 18 touchdowns on the year, and he won that Heisman by 933 uh, votes. So... Even if his quarterback did siphon on, off some votes with it usually being a quarterback award, and at least quarterbacks usually getting some, or with Vince, Vince Young also siphoning all, off a lot of the votes, he still ended up taking that Heisman with a runaway, runaway victory. So um, it's hard, it's not possible to say that it was unwarranted for Bush to win. But even though he later lost it in um, with NCAA, NCAA sanctionings, but... The Trojans definitely owned college football that year. And depending on how you define define a dynasty team, 
they were already a dynasty in the making, or you could say they were already a cemented dynasty at that point. Um, and behind coaching staff led by head coach Pete Carroll, who we now know went on to coach the Seattle Seahawks in the NFL, uh, they were able to like recruit the best class. Uh, they had star athletes, and they were able to put them in the best position to make them look like stars. And and really, they had the repertoire to pull off star play. So USC in the spotlight of college football and in the shadows of LA was definitely the team to beat in college football at the time. And there's a perfectly valid case at the time for to say that the Trojans were better than Texas throughout the season, even though they both finished undefeated. But in the end, Texas won the one game that counted. And it definitely counted being the national championship game. It was definitely the one that mattered the most. And Good for them, too, because they were also an incredible team. But uh, the game definitely didn't go as planned for USC. because They started off a little bit slow and thought that they'd be able to run away with the game uh, when Reggie Bush took another screen pass. But what people didn't see coming was the fact that Texas defenders were fast and they could keep up with Reggie Bush, who was not used to having players keep up with him. So they were able to track him down. Uh, he thought he was off to the races. But once they caught up to them, he tried to lateral the ball in this now famous play. And the ball hit the ground, and it was recovered by Texas safety Michael Huff. And that knockout punch definitely switched the the momentum in favor of Texas. And they were able to score in the next three possessions and went into the halftime up 16-10, which nobody, starting from USC players to fans to professional spectators, nobody saw that coming. But a lot of controversy obviously came out of this game for whichever side you were on. And Texas did get one wrong call that swung in their favor. And any and since any play could have determined the out- outcome of the game, this is still one that's point to, pointed to all these years later, especially by USC fans, as one that definitely affected the outcome. Because Texas got a first touchdown, their first touchdown, off of a play that should have been called down because quarterback Vince Young's knee was clearly on the ground even in replay. Uh, You could still see it. And the opposing quarterback for USC, Matt Liner, still says, obviously Vince's knee was down 100%. We all know it. They know it. At this point, it doesn't matter because it was a missed call. And obviously it was a big call, but it wasn't enough to swing the game in any which direction, especially for USC, who had plenty of chances to make that up later. But what USC didn't have was Vince Young, and that turned out to be the difference maker in the game because we watched Young turn into Superman before our eyes, pretty much, and he sliced and diced the USC defense all night. He ended up throwing 40 passes. He completed 30 of them for 267 yards, and he ran the ball on his own 19 times for another 200 yards and three touchdowns. So he almost single-handedly brought the Longhorns back from a two-score fourth-quarter deficit, and his all-time famous end zone score on a fourth and fifth ended up being the difference maker and delivered a 41-38 upset win for Texas in the national title game. And here's that call that is still so infamous to this day. Fourth and five, the national championship on the line right here. He's going for the corner. He's got it. Vince Young scores. All the dreams, all the hopes for the national championship come down to this play. Young from the shotgun. Back to throw. Vince looks. Under pressure. He'll tuck it in and run. Vince to the five. Young. Touchdown, Texas. Touchdown, Vince Young. He's done it again. Vince Young has given the Longhorns the lead with 19 seconds to play in the game. Yeah, to this day, that is still a call for the ages. And that game 
went down in history for a lot of obvious reasons. It combined championship stakes on the line. There was a lot of star power in it. That Players that went on to become NFL heavyweights. Like There are so many names in that one game alone that you can barely point to any other college football game as having so many stars um, produced out of two two legendary teams like Reggie Bush, uh, Matt Leinert, um, and it also had the legendary Keith Jackson calling his final game. So it really had the makings of everything, the drama, um, more than any other game almost in college football history. And it really ensured that it would be an instant classic for the ages and for years to come. And it, it still is talked about today because it is stands out so so much in the, in the minds of fans and it's still such an enjoyable and such a uh poignant moment for so many fans and uh that's definitely one national championship game that anybody nobody will forget anytime soon and not to mention that it was Texas's first national title in 36 years to the time and they were able to do it while denying the Trojans a chance to make history by winning their third national championship in a row so there are just so many reasons why this game is the the ep- epitome of what it means to be a great college football game. And years later, we're still talking about it. And and we still saw the fallout from that game years later because USC season that, that year, as incredible as it was, ended up not standing. And that's the downside of this story a little bit. And, and that's why it's so good to rewatch this game and remember how much it meant at the moment because... Since then, the NCAA has left USC's 2005 record tarnished. Um, They vacated their record from that season, so they're just listed as zero and zero for that year in the NCAA's warped view of of things. Um, And the Trojans themselves list their team as not having lost that game to Texas, which is unusual because the NCAA typically only vacates wins, but in their case... They vacated um, their entire season, any um, any games that they participated that in that year, and that included the Rose Bowl. So it was sad to see the hammer camp come down on USC that way uh, because they threw the book uh, at at the school for um, in back in 2010 for what they said for lack were, were lack of institutional control and um, violations that included handing improper benefits to uh, specifically Reggie Bush and also a basketball player that ended up being O.J. Mayo, who was only at the school for one year. So with all of the controversy and um, fights between um, the Heisman Committee and college football fans and just the opinions on how USC was punished with four years of probation and a two-year bull ban and loss of all their scholarships and the final point, whether or not they should go back uh, after Reggie Bush's Heisman, uh, resulted in Reggie Bush just giving the Heisman back himself, which is a really sad result of what a great season that he had and um, played in order to earn that Heisman, regardless of what the NCAA's rules were at, at the time. But all these years later, um, there were a lot of good fallouts from it, too, because it turns out Vince Young and Matt Leiner are still really good friends, and they still even talk about this game from time to time. And dozens of players from that game went on to have flourishing NFL careers, like um, linebacker Brian Cushing and uh, linebacker Ray Malaga, running back Jamal Charles, and tight end Jermichael Finley. So despite all that uh, it cost in order to, in the aftermath of the game, it was still one for the ages, and it is still considered one for the ages, even though it technically didn't happen according to NCAA records. But that's even more reason to go back and watch the game and enjoy it in all of its glory and for what it was in the moment, which was just great college football. Now that brings us to our first break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about a little bit of the rivalries that involve one of the teams. Since we covered USC, let's look a little bit into their division and see what rivals that they may have. 
Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the College Football Podcast. Now, before the break, we talked about the first game um, that was worth rewatching: the 2006 Rose Bowl featuring Texas and University of Southern California. And now we're going to take a little bit of a pause and look more into one of those storied teams, USC, a little bit more into their conference and the rivalries that exist. Because the Pac-12, even though they get overlooked a little bit uh, when it comes to football, they do have a long storied history. They've spent a lot of time at the top of the sport, and there are a lot of fierce competitors and comp- competitive teams uh, within the Pac-12. So the first one, uh, we're going to have to start off with Cal and Stanford, a.k.a. the big game. So once you see some of how the big games ended, specifically the 1982 matchup, uh, you'll understand why this football rivalry rivalry became uh, what it is. And in that game, specifically back in 1982, which is really what made this rivalry what it is, um, Cal's uh, five lateral 57-yard kickoff return as time expired uh, was the standout play in this brilliant rivalry and what a brilliant game that it turned out to be. And in this annual matchup, a lot of the times it comes down to a last minute score and or some magical play that uh, gives it to to one team or the other, Um, specifically in the 1982 big game, which came down to five laterals and a 57 yard kickoff as time expired um, to give uh, Cal the win. So there was a long streak of Cal victories. Uh, and they dominated the series for a long time. Uh, but now Stanford has been back in the last couple of years, and uh, they used uh, big victories in this game before to, to make a case for better seating in the postseason and even to make a case for some bowl games, such as uh, in 2010, they that win, Stanford's win over Cal in the big game uh, cleared their path to the Orange Bowl. And after beating them in 2011, they were able to make another BCS Bowl game. So Stanford now has the lead in the series. So whether it's a mid-tier bowl game that they're playing in or whether or not both teams are really good in the same season and they have more at stake and it ends up being uh, more of a New Year's Six Bowl game situation, uh, the big game has always had big implications for the teams that participate in it. And... The tradition between these teams is probably one of the top within the Pac-12. Now, the next team that has a rivalry within that conference is Oregon and Oregon State. And you know that a rivalry is really serious when it's nicknamed the Civil War, which is what this one is called. And for the past three years, it's been huge in terms of Rose Bowl bids for either one of their teams. And it's even taken the place of other rivalries, which we haven't gotten to yet, as one of the most storied in the Pac-12. And at this point, it's probably one of the most competitive. And every year, Oregon and Oregon State battle head-to-head. And even if one team isn't really good, and Oregon State really hasn't been that great in the last couple seasons, they always play like there's something at stake. And usually there always is at stake. And even in games that get crazy, like 
and don't have maybe playoff implications on the line for one team, they usually play spoiler for the other. Like back in 2008 when Oregon kept Oregon State from a Rose Bowl by beating them 65-38. to 38. Or in 2009 when Oregon was able to run away with the a narrow 37-33 to 33 win so that they would make the Rose Bowl. But overall, Oregon leads the rivalry and they have been taking control over it for the past few years. But you can always bet that Oregon State is going to step up for a battle that's called the Civil War and it'll always be worth the watch. Now, the last major rivalry in the conference is between USC and UCLA. And for two big name schools that battle each other all the time and are in the same city, you would think that they would have a nickname, but this rivalry actually doesn't have any official nickname, believe it or not. But that doesn't mean it's any less important or any less physical or intense than any other rivalry. And so many Rose Bowl bids and so many bowl games have been decided by this matchup right here, especially within the Pac, what used to be the Pac-10 and is now the Pac-12. A lot of those dominant seasons for both UCLA and USC um, came at the same time when they had to go through each other, which obviously makes for really, really good football. And they've had so many stars come out of bat- this gridiron battle. Like we mentioned before, Reggie Bush came out of USC and Matt, so did Matt Leinert. Um, we also had Carson Palmer and Maurice Jones-Drew who used to take place in this in this rivalry as well. So both teams have historic, traditional backgrounds, and that just makes the intensity even higher for situations where they have to meet up because neither of them are going to want to back down for the other, especially when you're battling, uh, battling for turf as they are when you're playing uh, your cross-city rival. So... Even though USC is ahead in this annual game and UCLA has kind of fallen behind, especially in the last few seasons, last few decades, really, when it comes to football, um, this game will always have implications. It has in the past, and even when, just like Oregon and Oregon State, both teams aren't competitive, it always will. Now we're going to take another break, but when we come back, we're going to jump right back into seeing which games from the past deserve another watch. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the College Football Podcast. And before the break, we took a little look at the Pac-12 and which of the most storied rivalries uh, stick out and still are ongoing to today. But we're going to get back into looking at which games are worth a rewatch. And the next game on the list is 2013's Kick 6 game between Alabama and Auburn. And this is a, a more recent one, so it definitely sticks out more in fans' memories. Uh, but it is, but recency bias is not a reason uh, to dismiss this one because it is already the South's most heated rivalry, and it just went over the top in 
there, believe it or not, there's se- only their 78th time meeting. And in college football, that is a low number for teams, especially teams that are in the same state, to go head to head. But for only 78 meetings, they have all been impactful, but none more than this. Because uh, this game going into it had an SEC championship spot up for grabs. And one of the most improbable plays and mind blowing plays in college football history was was the end result and by end result i mean literally happened on the last play so just to recap a little bit auburn came into this game 0 and 8 in sec competition the year before but that season they had been on sort of a miracle run even beating Georgia just a few weeks before, earlier that month, with a miracle tip pass that was already up for play of the year before this game even happened. So Auburn had already been having a little bit of a fairy tale story season, and this game definitely played its role in capping that off. But before we get ahead of ourselves, um, they definitely had magic coming into that this one, and the magic definitely faded early and turned into more of a heavyweight fight, especially since Auburn was considered the underdog coming into it, going against undefeated Alabama, top-ranked Alabama, dynastic team for however many seasons we'd seen them, Alabama. So their fans, and, and they had a little bit of an air of like they, they were expecting to win. And it was a little bit of a surprise to them when Auburn got on the scoreboard first. Because quarterback Nick Marshall let let loose and broke off for a 45-yard uh, rushing touchdown. But then Alabama came back and did what they did and reeled off 21 straight unanswered points. Uh, before the Tigers capped off the, the first half with a touchdown of their own. So they only went into the half down one touchdown. But of course, Alabama wasn't feeling afraid because they had played so dominantly for years on end. But this game had no shortage of big plays, to say the least. And Auburn came out on in the third quarter just firing. And they tied the game on their first drive out uh, before Bama pulled ahead with a play uh, that looked at the time like it was going to be the defining moment and really seal the game for them. And that was a 99-yard touchdown pass from quarterback Agent McCarron to now Dallas Cowboys superstar Amari Cooper. Uh, and that, at that point, was the play of the game, it was dazzling, and looked like it was the nail of the coffin. But then, Auburn, and their second-to-last big play, little did they know they had another big play coming, but their next big play was able to tie the game, and not only that, it also kind of changed the way football was played, because... They implemented, they really reached into a bag of trips, tricks and was able to implement the run-pass offense, which was in college football for a few years, but had never been used on a major stage in a major moment with the game on the line and wasn't regularly used in the NFL up to that point either. So with two minutes remaining in that game, um, they were able, they were able to uh, implement the run-pass option uh, and it ended up s- s- scoring the game and tying the game for them. Um, and NFL coaches later would specifically cite that touchdown as the inspiration behind run pass option option gaining popularity in the pros. And even speaking of the devil, devil former college head coach Pete Carroll, who's now with the Seahawks, used that in the first NFL game of the following season and was able to give Auburn a shout out afterwards. So uh, there, that accomplishment and that impact can't get go understated. But in the midst of Auburn crawling back all game, they were able to tie uh, the game at 28 with just 32 seconds left. And uh, Alabama drove the ball all the way to within Auburn's 40-yard 40, Auburn's 40 line, and they could have played for overtime at a tie game. That's what we expected. But uh, Nick Saban actually argued for a second to be put back on the clock, and what the expectation was that they would go for a Hail Mary. And once the review was over and the second was put back on the clock, 
Uh, they lined up for a 57-yard field goal kick instead, instead of going for a Hail Mary, which would have been best case scenario when they get, you win the game. Worst case scenario, you go to overtime and you try to win the game there. They would have been assuming they win the game there. But with one second left on the clock, they kicked a 57-yard field goal. And that kick fell short. But where the miracle comes in was that Tigers cornerback and unknowingly the to the nation's top punt returner at the time, Chris Davis, caught the ball near the back of the end zone. He headed up the left set left sideline, ran 109 yards, and the rest is history. And at Auburn walked off with a 34-28 win with less than one second remaining. And that call to this day is also still iconic. And here is a glimpse of what that sounded like. Mandel will hold it. Now they've officially made it 57 yards. Remember, a blocked kick can go the other way, too. He's got to be careful and get it up. On the way. No, returned by Chris Davis. Davis goes left. Davis gets a block. Davis has another block. Chris Davis. No flags. Touchdown, Auburn. An answered prayer. Now, of course, you can't blame the fans in Jordan Hare Stadium for going absolutely buck wild in that moment and for good reason too because that win sent Auburn to the SEC championship game that year where they ended up beating Missouri to advance to the 2013 national championship game which was the last BCS game before the college football playoff was in- implemented so even though they went on to to play in that national championship and and ultimately lost to Florida State it was still a moment that Auburn fans and college football fans would never forget And it lives on in college football infamy. Now it's time to take another break. But when we come back, since we touched on the biggest rivalry in the SEC, we're going to dive more into SEC rivalries and see if any other team challenges Auburn and Alabama for the top spot. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the College Football Podcast. Now, before the break, we covered the kick six game between Auburn and Alabama. And since there are two SEC teams, why not take this chance to dive into the SEC and all of the rivalries that it produced? And the first up on the list is, of course, the game that we just covered. Auburn and Alabama play what they call the Iron Bowl. And it's not just the best rivalry in the SEC. A lot of people say it's the best rivalry in college football, period. And there are some other teams and some other conferences that might have something to say about that. But the two teams play within the same state. And, of course, that definitely just riles up the tension between the two, and especially between the fan bases. And you will not catch either fan base crossing over to the other or wearing the other's colors. Like, that is a forbidden no-no. And they take that seriously, and it runs deep. So it's not a matchup that's taken lightly for sure. And again, they haven't met met that many times, but Alabama still holds the series lead over Auburn. They've kind of 
have taken control, especially in the last few years when they've run through the college football um, universe with their dominance. And even though they've played fewer games than other rivalries because they took a little bit of a hiatus in the early 1900s, they've still had plenty of thrillers and it has not been any less intense than if they had played more games. Honestly, we don't even know what that would look like and we might not want to know what it would look like if they had an even deeper history connected to one another. Um, they've had plenty of games to speak of um, dating back all the way to... 1982, uh, all the way up to the kick six, and even in 2014, where they went back and forth in a 55 54 final score shootout. So, all it's all thrills for both sides involved, and even if it's not just thrills on the line, the winner usually makes um, either the national title game or the college football playoff. So, there's always a lot on the line even when it's not just bragging rights. But even if there wasn't anything making it more interesting, the Iron Iron Bowl is already the most important game on the college football calendar. Now, the next rivalry in the SEC that goes back and has a lot of storied history is between Florida and Georgia, a.k.a. the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, which is what they like to call it. Uh, but it's more than a football game to them. It's an event, and even uh, even as late as it's played in the year, it's usually played in the early fall. Uh, down in Florida and Georgia, it usually marks the end of the summer for them. So it's a big weekend-long travel event where, where people from both states uh, gather, not together, obviously, not, not together, but um, they gather during the final weekend of October or the first weekend of November, usually when, whenever it falls. Uh, just a battle for usually SEC East title hopes. And not even just that, but more importantly for them, bragging rights. And they've had a lot of good memories in the matchups that they've had. And there are a lot of standout games within the rivalry. But ultimately, it's just the can't-miss event for college football fans in the South, especially in the South. And as intense as those first two rivalries were, it cannot be understated how important the Egg Bowl is between Ole Miss and Mississippi State. And SEC fans who watch these teams play all the time know already, but in the last handful of seasons, the rest of the college football world has been getting a glimpse of just how intense this rivalry can get between teams that might not even be considered the top of their conference. Uh even though they're in a power of five conference, they might not be considered top programs within um, that conference or within football at all. But Ole Miss and Mississippi State play just as intense of a matchup that, as anybody else, even uh, going back to 1997, where a late two-point conversion uh, gave Ole Miss a one-point win over Mississippi State. Or in 1999, where Mississippi State's uh, fourth quarter rally led them to top the competition that year. Or even looking at 2013 uh, with a fumble in overtime into the end zone uh, cost Ole Miss the game and gave the game away to Mississippi State. So the two teams have met over 110 times and it doesn't always end up on the national stage like the 2014 meeting did because they were both ranked teams at the time. But you'd be hard-pressed to find any game in the SEC that would be more competitive than this interstate matchup. They've had a long line of classic games between the two, and it's good that in the last few years they've been able to take uh, more of a national stage because... We should all be looking more forward to what is coming out of these two programs. And it's time for another break, but when we come back, we're going to take a look at the last game that you should be paying attention to if you are looking for a trip down memory lane. 
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the College Football Podcast. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about SEC rivalries and just how intense they can get and how fun they are to watch those matchups. And now we're going to jump back into looking back at memorable games. And another game that's worth rewatching is the 2007 Fiesta Bowl between Oklahoma and Boise State. And this one definitely sticks out amongst college football fan memories and even rivals how uh, rivals in importance to the 2006 Rose Bowl amongst a lot of fans. Uh, This game is definitely classified really high and that's because it is the ultimate underdog story. On paper, this game had no business being competitive at all because here comes Boise State, which is a mid-major upstart at best, uh, who managed to to roll to a 12 and 0 undefeated season and earn the WAC the conference title um versus Oklahoma who was basically college football royalty and is still considered college football royalty to this day and they rolled to their own conference title in the Big 12 and an 11 and 1 season so they were considered a touchdown favorite over Boise State and they were painted as David and Goliath, every cliche that could be used to describe the difference between the two levels of the two teams uh, was thrown out there. The Boise State was called the little guys. They were used underdog all the time. And that really just painted the scene as... The game was Oklahoma's to lose, uh, since especially since Boise State had only entered Division One football um, only about a decade earlier, and they were only the second non-BCS conference team to earn a bowl bid at that level. So nothing was really expected for them. They were literally just looking like they were happy to be there, but they had better expectations and higher expectations for themselves, obviously, than the college football world had for them and it was by far the biggest program game they had had up to that point in history even to this point you could probably say still in history and the underdog Broncos definitely held their own for 60 minutes and more because they were able to take this game to overtime but for the first three quarters alone they controlled the game and they led 28-17 going into the fourth quarter but Oklahoma woke up in the fourth and they were led by uh, Adrian Peterson, who was also returning from his own long-term collarbone injury at the time, um, led their scoring 22 straight points in the final 90 seconds. So OU was really looking like the team that they were advertised to be at the time. But Boise State bounced back, luckily for them, from their giving up an 18-point lead uh, with a 50-yard lateral play, hook and lateral play, on a fourth and long in the final seconds of regulation and managed to tie up the game. So then fast forward to overtime, the clock winding down, and it was looking like double overtime is on the horizon. And Boise State had just scored a touchdown in overtime to set up the game-tying extra point. 
And instead, they sent the offense back on for one last play. And they weren't risking double overtime. It was all or nothing at that point. They were either going to win or go home. And here's where it starts to get good. If you think the game sounded good up until that point, with lead changes and underdog leads and and comebacks and overtime, it just got better from there. Because they talk about pulling out a bag of tricks. They pulled out on a two-point conversion try that would just become another story in college football history or would cement them as a legendary team. They pulled out the Statue of Liberty play, the ultimate backyard play, and scored a two-point conversion to win 43-42 in overtime. With some type of run pass option going to the right. Boise State for the win. They hand it off to Johnson. Boise State has won the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. Can you believe it? Now that obviously set off a wild celebration for Boise State fans. And Ian Johnson, who was the running back who made that winning score, after celebrating in stands with all the fans, went to over to his Boise State cheerleader girlfriend, dropped to one knee, and popped the question proposed to her on the spot on national TV. And of course, she said yes. And that's just one reason why this game is just almost too good to believe. It is the ultimate underdog story. It, had, it hit every point that would make you laugh, cry, cheer. It had you on the edge of your seats. It had comebacks. It had spectacular plays. It had it all. And it's not unlike the other two games that were mentioned in that in that way. And in a time, especially like now, without live sports, it's even more special to look back on moments like this and remember how they made us feel, feel that way again. And it just goes to show why sports is so important. It's time to take one last break, but when we get back, we're going to keep looking into rivalries. But this time, we're going to look back at which ones might be the best of all time across all the conferences. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the College Football Podcast. Now, before the break, we took a look at the, one, some of the best games in college football history that are definitely worth a rewatch. And we covered a little bit about some of the conference rivalries and the biggest teams that stick out in those rivalries. But now it's time to take a look at some of the most historic rival, rivalries across all of college football and the teams that really took the battle to the gridiron. And when we saw those teams hit the field, we knew that some magic would be worked and those games would feature something incredible. And there is no better place to start when it comes to talking about rivals than with Ohio State and Michigan. And even though this one's been lopsided for a a while, and honestly, it's been lopsided for a a long while because both teams tend to win in streaks, uh, Ohio State has the edge as of late, and they've won the last eight in a row. But overall, Michigan leads 58-51 to six. And when we're talking about rivalries, it's only right to start here because this one is an annual hate-filled fest between both of the teams. And the traditions that you see enacted, especially when these games come around, and not even just then, but all year round, but especially when these games come around, are to another level. Like you'll see in Ohio, you'll see M's crossed out on signs. In Michigan, you won't see red anywhere. And the they 
take it to heart. And it's partially because it's so deeply ingrained in both of the state's histories. And even the rivalry alone dates back to 1897. And it's been played every year, 116 times between 1918 and 2020. So it it definitely contains deep historic tradition uh, and even coaches, players, fans, As much as it may consume them, they also love it. And you can see how much they love it. And you can see the love for the game and just for college football in general when these two teams come together. And it's honestly one of the first rivalries that we've ever seen develop. And no other rivalry approaches the combination of history and balanced competition and consistent championship moments on the line as this one and what makes it so great is probably partially the fact that it does date back to the early 1800s even and the Toledo War of 1835 and a lot of the people who were at that first game in 1897 had personal memories of that Toledo War and a lot of those residual feelings kind of poured over from the war zone to the gridiron as society transitioned and the rivalry between the states just kind of morphed into the rivalry between the schools that represent those states. And the game, which is refer it's referred to now by a lot of people, is usually during the last week of the regular season. And that is what puts all of the conference and national championship implications on the line. So obviously on top of the normal bragging rights that they lift for, in both states, they usually are also trying to get past each other on their way to greatness. And this past season was a great one, a great one for that. And especially if you're an Ohio State fan, and it really went in their direction. And they obviously made it all the way to the college football playoff and the 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 semifinal game. But Michigan has had their great years too. And it's just a matter of time before the balance shifts in this one again. And we get another reignition of the fiery passion that makes this rivalry so great. Now, moving on to the next one, the Red River River rivalry is between Texas and Oklahoma. And just as the Michigan and Ohio State rivalry dates way back to before the schools even existed, this uh, rivalry also uh, has deep historical roots and is also more of an interstate battle than anything else. And the name comes from the boundary that even partially separates Texas and Oklahoma and all of the conflicts in the past that have risen over, uh, over the border and between the two states in general, like the Red River Bridge War War back in 1931. So The Big 12, this Big 12 dynamic duo, two of the big powerhouses of that conference, have been battling it out since before they were states, really, before they were settled. And they really are each other's top competition, with either one having won the Big 12 or shared the title in the majority of the last 15 years. And Texas leads the series overall, 62-48-5. But Oklahoma's won the last two meetings, and they have been more of the dominant national team in the last couple of years. But that usually doesn't have any bearing on how fiercely these teams play each other, as any rivalry, even when both teams aren't on the national stage or aren't playing as well as they used to, both teams always step it up to to, to play each other. And they play each other 115 total times. So they're very used to... to this competition and they even exchanged three trophies over this showdown based off of the outcome of the, of the game. And the best one being um, the golden hat, uh, which is a gold 10 gallon hat used to be made of bronze and it's kept by the winning school's athletic department for a full year before it's put back on the line again every year. And it is basically just a physical representation of their bragging rights And as advanced as we get and as good as these programs get, one thing, the one thing that never gets old is being able to brag over your biggest opponent about beating them. 
And these two teams, and by extension, these two states, take it so seriously that even the governors of Texas and Oklahoma exchange the governor's trophy, trophy and frequently pays, plays bets on this game. And uh, the losing governor usually has to present a side of beef to the winning governor, which usually ends up being donated to charity or some type of fun bet that usually has benefits for charity. But it's obviously still taken very personally by the people in these states. And as much fun as it can be to watch and participate in, neither squad wants to end up on the losing side. Now the next matchup in this rivalry countdown is another storied one, and that's Army Navy. And if you have never seen the Black Knights and the Midshipmen play each other, you need to watch because Army Navy is one of the most most traditional and enduring rivalries in college football. And as old as Ohio State and Michigan are, Army Navy is even older, believe it or not, which dates all the way back to 1890, which is when they played their first matchup And they've been playing every year since 1930 for 120 total meetings at this point. And while Navy narrowly holds a 61-52-7 lead in the series and won last year's meeting, this one has been very back and forth and it very much embodies the spirit of both service academies, of the armed forces, of... Just college football in general, just competition in in general. And the NCAA always loves to preach about amateur competition especially, but this is definitely amateur competition at its finest because this is both just military academies just upholding the long history between them, but it's also been so special that sitting presidents attend and it's become the game that finishes off the college football regular season. So Army-Navy is a quintessential classic, and there was a lot of controversy surrounding last year's game, not because of what happened on the field, but because of what happened off the field, if you'd like to look into those events. But it's the one matchup that you can be sure that isn't going anywhere, and it kind of just embodies how important college football plays into the culture Now, if we want to talk classic matchups, there's no way we can leave a team like Notre Dame out. And since they don't have it always belong to a conference or have an interconference rival or anything like that, they had to go out and look for a rival. So the formation of the Notre Dame and USC rivalry kind of unfolded a little bit differently. And even though it didn't come together organically and doesn't have a history uh, based in its location or anything like that, uh, nothing could stop this rivalry from being as powerful as it was, except for World War II, because between 1943 and 1945, those are the only three years that these teams haven't played each other and, since they started in 1926. And for 91 total matchups in college football history, they have left more of an impact than maybe fans who are, maybe fans who watch today aren't as aware of because both of these teams don't sit at the top of the the country when it comes to college football powerhouse teams anymore, even though they both have a long dominant history of being teams to beat. But Notre Dame has won the last three straight matchups and they've traditionally been elite programs. So since the schools have combined to win 39 national championships and 14 Heisman uh, Trophy winners, they're considered one of the most important to the sport because of how they've been able to put themselves on the map in a way that transcended just college football. And it's called they've been called the greatest intersectional rivalry for a reason. And as great as it became, it's hard to believe, or maybe it's easy to believe, I should say that the series was created primarily for financial and political reasons because it dates back to the 1920s, of course. And back then, many colleges, including the Big Ten, which was at that point called the Western Conference, sought to fight against the commercialism, which was increasingly seeping into college football and college athletics in general, which obviously didn't work because we have completely commercialized college sports at this point. 
But at the time, they were still trying to fight back against it. And part of the concern was that teens would receive large payouts uh, to travel long distances to play in bowl games. And Notre Dame at the time had difficulty scheduling opponents, especially in the local Western Conference, because of a ban that was placed on the member schools from playing Notre Dame. So they were forced to seek out opponents nationally from all over the country to fill up their schedule instead of just sticking to teams that were within their region, which was what was common at the time. Obviously, back then, it's a lot harder to get around. Um, But Notre Dame started winning landmark games against the behemoths in college football at the time. Um, And they garnered a lot of respect and interest from the Rose Bowl Committee. And they wanted to have Notre Dame, with their newfound national fame, play Pacific Coast Conference, which is now called the Pac-12, um, teams for the 1924 upcoming season. And the head coach of Notre Dame at the time, the legendary Newt Rockney, uh, realized how lucrative traveling out to L.A. could be every year. Uh, and um, he initially wanted USC to be their opponent, And because Stanford and Cal wanted no part since at the time Notre Dame is a Catholic school. And back then Catholic schools were seen as inferior. Um, But then uh, Stanford saw how much money that they can wait, they they could make by playing Notre Dame. And they turned, uh, they changed their opinion and they agreed to play them for the 1925 Rose Bowl. And that's where the motivation to make USC a permanent, opponent and a permanent rival of Notre Dame came up because there was still a desire to bring Notre Dame back to the West Coast every other year, uh, generating more revenue, obviously, for everybody involved. And it's no surprise that money grabs, as common as they are now, were just as common back then. But this one resulted in a rivalry being born. And it definitely had a benefit that... At this point, in this day and age, you could even put a dollar sign on it because it did so much to grow the game of college football and to make it the more naturally transit game that we see today. Who knows how long it would have taken for teams to play each other outside of their regional zones if Notre Dame didn't break through the barrier first and were forced to look outside uh, their area to play opponents. And that just kind of set the path for the kind of college football schedule we know today. So... They definitely played a hand in making the game more interesting for all of us to watch. And last but not least, there are two recently defunct rivalries that have plans to return that are definitely worth worth putting out. The first one being Pitt in West Virginia, a.k.a. the Backyard Brawl, which started in 1895, but they've taken a a 10-year hiatus Uh, starting in 2012, and they're planning to restart the rivalry in 2022 and believe that both fan bases have it circled because when they were playing each other, that was definitely one intense rivalry. The other is Texas and Texas A&M, who've been on a hiatus since the Aggies spurned the Big 12 and moved over to the SEC back in 2012. And now for years, both teams have said that they want to play each other but we have yet to see a game be scheduled between the two. So hopefully we'll see that be added back to the college football schedule sooner rather than later. And we can all get back to watching our favorite rivalries in action. Now, thanks for listening to the GSMC College Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.